Most of it was online, I presume, just to be on the safe side. But uh, we're glad that you're here today to come and worship with us on this Sunday before Christmas. If you are our first-time guest, we'd be glad to have you with us today. Uh, we do ask if you would look in that pocket there in front of your seat. There's a card. We ask that you fill that out and give us a little information about you. And then we will, um, at the end of our service, just turn that in at our welcome center, either in the back or through here. And we've got a gift we'd love to share with you for being here today. Do want to take this time and say thank you to our choir and to our praise team and our praise band for their uh, concert last week. Uh, you missed a blessing if you were not here, so I do want to say thank you to them. Also remind everybody, uh, if you notice in your, in your bulletin there, there is a list of the uh, poinsettias that were bought in honor or in memory of someone, so please take note of that. And also everybody that, uh, that purchased a poinsettia, we appreciate that, and don't forget to take them with you when you leave today so you can enjoy them this week uh, at home. Do we want to encourage everybody to check the mailbox out here for your Christmas cards? And if you haven't put those in, you can still do it next week, I'm sure, because uh, that box will stay up probably at least another week or so. And don't forget to put your postage in the mailbox that's on top. Uh, and use our postage rather, or our mailbox rather than Uncle Sam's if you're sending a, a Christmas card to one of our church members. So make sure you check that before you leave today. Uh, all that money goes to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal for Faymont this year is $3,400. I think we've collected about $800 at this point. Uh, so uh, remember that in your prayers, what God would have you to do towards meeting our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goal. That Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to support missionaries around the world. We've got a video we want to share with you at this time uh, about our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And after that, I'm going to call on Brother Dan, our Deacon of the Week, to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Joseph. God brought them out of something that, at the beginning of the story, makes no sense. Even in the middle of the story, you sometimes wonder, God, what are you doing? It's an isolated country run by a military government and under civil war for the last 60 years. And I had to live in a hotel. We weren't allowed to go very many places. We were even watched and followed sometimes. I was able to get permission to live up there teaching English. So I started having this Bible study. Within a year, we had baptized believers, I knew that's where I was supposed to be. One morning I got to the school, another friend pulls into the compound just frantic. There were investigators. I'd just been kicked out of my country. I felt lost. I knew where my heart wanted to be. But I had to trust that God had a reason, and I have to be okay with not knowing why. I was in a neighboring country. I was in this big city. I went to the market to buy some food. All of a sudden, I hear the language of my people. And I realize there are about a half a million of them living in my country. They come here just overwhelmed with life in the big city. I felt a lot like they were. I was a refugee. I was in a country I didn't want to be in, but I couldn't go back. Some of them found community in a local church here. And I went to the pastor of that church and asked them, what were the needs here? And after some discussion, he said, what we need is a Bible school in this city, how to share their faith, how to start a church. I don't know how to start a school. If I need to learn a new skill, I'll learn a new skill. The first day of school, I had 50 students show up. They just kept coming and coming, with little or no sleep, just because they're hungry to learn. And at this point, they're reaching their own people. And they go to a different part of the city to share their faith with factory workers, many of whom have never heard the name of Jesus, show them love, share Christ with them, and plant the gospel seed. 
Reforms are happening in the country I was banned from. They have new leaders now. I've been granted entry and I'm making plans to move back again. Looking back on all this, I see that wherever God wants me to be, that's where I feel like I'm home.
Together, proclaim the holy birth. 
praise today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 John chapter 4. We'll be there in, in just a moment. Now there was once these two old farmers that lived side by side in their land to join each other. And they kind of had a, a falling out with each other. And it was all because of a stray cat. And, and so what had happened is, is as the stray cat was going around, they begin to both begin to feed it, and they claim that it was theirs. And so it kind of started spiraling downward from there as far as their relationship until one day one of the farmers took and, and dug a, a ditch that rerouted a spring that divided their properties. And so after that had happened, a carpenter came by to one of the farmers and said, hey, I'm a carpenter, and... I'm just looking for some work. And so the farmer said, well, you know, my neighbor has dug a ditch to keep us divided, so I don't want to see the old guy anyway, so I'm going to build a big, nice fence. And the carpenter said, well, I'm going to need a lot of wood, and he took him out to the, the woodshed and showed him what a uh, little bit of lumber he had, and he said, well, I'm going to have to have a whole lot more lumber than this to, to build the fence like you want. So the farmer said, that's fine. He said, I'll go into town and I'll go ahead and, and take and get some more lumber and you begin to work with what I have here. So the carpenter said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So as the farmer came driving back up down that old road to, to where the carpenter was supposed to be building the fence, he looked out across the field and he didn't see where the fence was going up. But he saw where the carpenter had built a bridge across the ditch. And so he was thinking, why in the world is he doing this? So he drives up, and as he's driving up, the other farmer comes out, and he's got that old uh, grin on his face, and he approaches the farmer with his hand stuck out. He said, you are a brave man. He said, I didn't think you would ever want to hear my voice again. Can you forgive me? To which the first farmer's uh, surprise response was, you know, I'll, I'll forgive you. I knew it was your cat anyway. <laughs> Some of you get it later. But, but anyway, that's, that was an introduction that the songwriter David Wilcox wrote for his song, Fearless Love. And, and in his song, he kind of goes in a, a little bit deeper and it weaves together another narrative of church protest and how people are caught up in remembering Jesus' teachings to his disciples about loving their enemies. And he used the example of the Roman soldiers that Jesus himself had spoke about in the parable. And we're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more in, in detail. But the chorus goes... Fearless love makes you cross the border. That love that Jesus embodied in our world is indeed a fearless love. Besides simply lacking any fear, the love of Jesus defies and overcomes fear. And today as we continue our journey, journey through Advent and through our series on Rediscovering Christmas, we are focusing on that love that Jesus brought into our world and into our lives. You know, over the, the past three weeks, as we've journeyed through this, this study, we've been looking at different people and the characteristics that they brought to the Christmas story. But today, I want us to kind of step back from that and kind of look at all the people in the account of Christ's birth. 
as we do this, we'll realize that the birth of Christ brings together a wide variety of people across many different divides and contrasts. Now, if we were to start with the Christmas story in, in order, we would first come to Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. We have the old and the young. We have the prophets and the covenants of Israel's past and the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah and the new spiritual future that was promised to the Israelite people. We have the separation and death of the past and the restoration of life now, the present. Then we meet the shepherds and the angels, the beings of earth and of heaven, the physical and the spiritual. And then at the stable, there we have the animals and the humans, the beings of creation. And then we can look at Matthew's Christmas account and meet the Magi, the Magi. Who were these mysterious visitors from the east? No, we're not entirely sure, but we know that they have followed a star a long distance to find and worship the promised Messiah. Whether they are most likely astrologers or some kind of rulers, they are noble and wealthy men to demonstrate God bridging yet another divide. The Magi are the esteemed opposite of the lowly shepherds in the human social structure. But importantly, they are Gentiles and not Jews. And their inclusion in Jesus' birth story echoes the radical idea that Christ the Messiah brings salvation and restoration to all people, not just the Jews. The Magi are also holy men of some sort. They seem to belong to more of a mystical tradition than the Jewish leader's structure. But they are important contrast, but they importantly contrast the spiritual Jewish leaders of that day. There were no Pharisees or Sadducees or other VIP religious people who were invited to the manger that night. Instead, there are these travelers of different race and culture who receive an audience with King Herod, albeit a sinister intentions that King Herod had, yet these are who were willing to disrupt their lives with a great journey and humble themselves to worship the baby of a poor, unassuming couple in the countryside. The cast of characters that God has assembled for the arrival of his son on earth is far from the expectations that any of us would have ever imagined. And probably even far farther from the expectations of the people of that time who lived and breathed within the culture and its divisions. To us, it may seem like a ragtag bunch, but to the Jews, it was downright blasphemous that the Messiah would be so lowly and associate with the full spectrum of unclean humanity and creation that night. Could Jesus have united any more divisions simply by being born. I think he pretty much covered them all. And in doing so, God revealed several things about his love that we are going to explore here this morning. And the first thing is that Christ is love embodied. The Bible talks about love in many places. God is love. And the Bible is his love letter to us his love story for all humanity. From the very beginning of creation, God, spent, God made people and spent time in the garden as companions with his children. When sin entered the world, bringing death and brokenness and separation for such a close companionship with God, he continued to work and covenant with humans. Through generations and generations, he worked his plans and promised a Messiah to make a way to restore his relationship with all of humanity. That way was Jesus, who is described as the bridegroom of the church. The relationship with God that he brings us into brings us is a relationship of love. It is a reunion with love 
itself. Let's stand as we take and read how John so eloquently describes the love of God in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. And God's word says, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe that love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Dear and Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning to seek your word, to apply it to our lives, we just ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit to move mightily among us here this morning. Father, let the words that come from my mouth be nothing more and nothing less than what you would have me to say. For it's in your holy and precious name that we ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. John tells us here that God is love. And God personifies love. Love is his nature. And he has shown it to us by sending us his one and only son, Jesus Christ. When we come to Jesus, giving him our lives, we are restored to love. We live in him, and he lives in us. We can count on God's love, and it won't let us down. It fills us and fuels us. It calls us and enables us to love each other. Which brings us to another point that John gives us here, is that love defines and propels us. Jesus brought this reconnection and restoration to love himself when he entered the world. Near the end of his earthly ministry, as he gathered with his 12 disciples for the Passover meal together, he tells them this in John 13, 34 and 35. You can look on the, on the board and it'll be up there. It says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, as Jesus is sitting here teaching his disciples, he wants to make sure that they love each other and others like he loves. They, Jesus is basically saying, I want you to love like I love. And here's the most important thing. How will people know that they are followers of Christ? by the love that they show others. You know, you've probably heard, heard this before. You know, how will people know that we are Christians? It's by how we show our love and how we love one another and how we love our neighbors and, and our community, those around us. Love is what defines us. It marks us and characterizes us, or at least it should. Now, the church hasn't always done a great job of this. And I'm not talking about FEMA, I'm talking about the church in general, okay? But the church hasn't always done a great job. We as the church body don't always do a great job of this either. It's easy for us to take and point fingers at some pretty big wrongs by the church through history. And we can all probably think of public Christians and churches in our time that make us cringe with anger and embarrassment at their rigid, unloving 
actions. But we also must look at ourselves too. Of course, none of us is perfect as individuals or even as a collective church. But each of us can certainly find opportunity in the Christmas season, season and in our current culture climate to allow God's love to flow through us to others. Love empowers us to cross borders. We are living in divided times. I mean, our culture, our nation, our people have multiplied the ways in which to divide us. It seems that us and them have been running very high as of late. And it's by no means an excuse, but throughout history, our world has been filled with wars and plunders and oppressions. There has always been the weak and the powerful, the haves and the have-nots. There has always been too much of us versus them since Jesus' day and even further back into history. And sadly, still today, we still have that mentality. It's why Jesus' teaching was so radical. It's why God's love is so radical also. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, he says, You have heard it, heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus didn't only tear down the walls of division at his birth. He continuously reached across the, the chasm of separation and exclusion. He befriended, befriended the hated tax collectors, and he even invited one of them, Matthew, to come and be one of his 12 disciples. He spoke to the Samaritan a woman at the well which broke a lot of, of societal taboos at once. I mean, Jews were not supposed to associate with Samaritans, and definitely a Jewish a man was not supposed to even talk with a woman like that in public. Jesus even told his listeners that if a dreaded Roman soldier came in and asked him to, to carry his pack for a mile, he said, I want you to do better than that. I want you to carry it two miles instead. And one of Jesus' most powerful parables about this kind of unexpected love in action is the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, you know, you know the, how the story goes. I mean, here it is. Here's this man who was beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. And then you have a priest and, and a, a Levite that comes by and instead of them taking care of a fellow human or a fellow man, all right, they go to the other side of the road and they pass by him. I mean, they don't even want to have nothing to do with him because they look down upon him. But then the Samaritan man came by and he stopped and he bandaged up his wounds. He took care of him and he even took him to an inn and paid for the innkeeper to take care of him and said, hey, look, if it costs any more, I'm coming back by. I'll pick him up and I'll pay you the difference. That's a good and challenging story for us this morning, isn't it? But it was astounding to Jesus' listeners at that time. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Their racism against the Samaritans went back centuries from when the kingdom of Israel had split up. The Samaritans intermarried with foreigners. They started their own, own temple. They started their own worship. And the Jews considered them an inferior race with a corrupt religion and, and viewed them with prejudice and disdain. But this is who Jesus was holding up as an example of loving our neighbor. Jesus was crossing that divide. He reached across the cultural, the spiritual, the political, the racial division, and today he calls us to do the very same. He was illustrating that kind of love that he later described in 1 John uh, chapter uh, 4, 18 and 19 there. It says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. 
We love because he first loved us. Jesus' love is a fearless love that calls us and enables us to cross the borders and to tear down the barriers, to reach out above the disagreements. The fear that is driven out by love is the fear that is within ourselves. Love overcomes the fear. Love overcomes the fear of the other who may not look like us or sound like us or share the same perspectives and experiences as us. Maybe reaching across the divide begins in your family. Maybe it begins in your home or in your neighborhood or in your workplace or your community. But Jesus at Christmas and all times calls us together into his loving presence and invites us to make room for all, whether we think they deserve it or whether they deserve to be there. There is humility and love, a willingness to put someone else first. Sometimes love means taking the simple step of building the bridge as a gesture and an invitation. Sometimes it's being willing to listen and not defend. It is always being willing to choose to see someone else, not as the other, but as equally loved by God and equally welcomed into his presence and equally drawn into and propelled out of his miraculous, divine, all-consuming love. This is God's love. This is the gift of Christ. And this is the heart of Christmas. As we are rapidly approaching Christmas Day this Friday, I invite you and challenge you to rediscover Christmas by rediscovering the all overwhelming, all-encompassing, all-welcoming love of God. Where can you build bridges this coming week instead of walls? The Christmas story is a powerful story filled with wonder and miracles, and it is very real. It is the story of Jesus coming to earth as the most wonderful gift of all eternity. As we have walked through the various parts of the Christmas story over the, the past uh, four Sundays, including this Sunday, we have explored the intersection of Jesus in the lives of real people who played a role in his arrival. And we have seen that he brought hope, love, joy, and peace into their lives and our lives and that it is very real to us today. We have learned that we can find hope in our uncertainties. When uncertainty surrounds us, the promise of Christ fills us with the hope to carry on. Hope is the breath that keeps us alive. Hope is the fuel of our faith and dreams and possibility. Hope is that whisper that says, maybe, just maybe it's the spark in the cold darkness that catches flame in the worst sufferings and atrocities and catastrophes of human history there have always remained a flicker of hope throughout the history of the Jewish people there was the hope of God's covenant and even though time dragged on and on and the nations were plundered and the peoples cried out oh God how long for century and centuries. But there was those who kept hope alive, living expectantly and faithfully, trusting openly and wholeheartedly that God would come through. Simeon and Anna were two of those. They have lived long, difficult lives. They had known loss and disappointment, but they had not abandoned the hope of the promise. And when they saw the baby Jesus they knew without a doubt that this was the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. They were ready and waiting for that moment, and they embraced the moment of this hope fulfilled with rejoicing and worshiping and spreading the news. The flames of their hope spread and multiplied. How is your flame of hope today? This has been a tough year, the kind of year that threatens to extinguish our, the flames of our hope. No matter what you're facing, no matter where you're at, you can rediscover hope this Christmas in the coming of the Christ child. 
we can find peace in our struggles. The struggles are real, but the peace of Christ transcends within us, even in our darkest days. The announcement of Christ's birth came in the dark of the night. The angels began their announcements to the shepherds with the words, Do not fear. They were afraid because they were human just like us. And there's so much in our world that causes us to fear today. There's so much that happens that we don't, don't understand, and we struggle to understand it. But for the shepherds, on that terrifying night, those heavenly beings showed up in the middle of the night. For us, that's the normal pressures and disappointments and uncertainties of our frailty in our broken world. And that's true even without the events of a global pandemic that we find ourselves in the midst of. The peace of God brings us restoration. It is the peace that settles our souls deeply. It is the calm acceptance that it is well with my soul no matter what swirls and storms around us. Storms will come. The winds will blow. and They may be howl, howl, howling for you right now. But you can step into the shelter of peace of Christ. It is a peace that transcends all understanding. And it is a peace that you can rediscover through Christ this season. We can also find joy in our discouragements. We all have bad days, weeks, maybe even years. But even then, Christ can fill us with the joy that defies our circumstances. Psalms 30, the last part of, of verse 5 there says, Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. Sometimes that night can feel so long. Sometimes it may be night after night after night, and it may carry on and carry on. Sometimes that hope, that joy, our happiness just feels so distant that it appears that it's out of reach for us. And then sometimes joy pours out of us like the eruption of Old Faithful in Yellowstone, not Jellystone. And sometimes joy bubbles up slowly in our lives. For some, Christmas is a joyful season filled with songs and celebrations, traditions, and conference. For others, the expectations of Christmas joy serve as a reminder of deeper pains, disappointments, and the lack of all the merry merriment that we're supposed to enjoy during the Christmas season. For some of us, Christmas may bring a mixture of both. It is my hope that we all rediscover joy this Christmas season as we choose to rejoice. As we return our focus to Jesus, we can find our strength. As we pour out our hearts to him, even in the midst of our pain and disappointments, he can transform our weeping into the joy that lets us appreciate and enjoy the goodness of his greater work within us and in our world. And then as we saw today, we can find love in our differences. There is so much in our world that drives us apart. The love of Christ runs deeper than our differences with a flood of grace, forgiveness, and unity. We long so deeply to be loved. The desire for love is so dominant in our, our, in our culture that when future and when future archaeologists and anthropologists explore artifacts of our era, they'll probably conclude that love was one of, if not the most quality, most desired quality of our society today. Our songs, movies, TV shows, and literature are filled with themes of love, longing for it, celebrating it, mourning its loss. And even at Christmas, there's a whole genre of holiday romance songs and movies and shows. We are captivated by love, but we struggle so badly to love each other on an individual and societal levels today. Instead of a culture that exemplifies love, we're a nation and a world filled with division and conflict and hatred. 
And despite our best intentions, our broken human nature divides us. Jesus, on the other hand, is the bridge of love that unites us. He is the long-promised Messiah sent because God loves us so much that he allowed his only son to be the sacrifice for all of our sins and our shortcomings. And when he did, Jesus made the way for us to be restored in our relationship with God, love himself. As we rediscover Christmas, may we rediscover the love of Christ, the perfect love that allows us to experience complete acceptance by God and the perfect love that removes our fears. And as this love washes over us and fulfills us from within, I pray that it propels us to reach across the divisions around us, even to our enemies, with humility, forgiveness, and grace. Christ has come with hope, peace, joy, and love. Christ has come to change our world and to change us forever. Look at how Luke describes Jesus' arrival. In Luke uh, 2, verses 6 and 7, he says, While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. When she gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Here is such a humble birth. Such an understa understated beginning to life, yet a normal entry into our existence. Human birth as a fragile, helpless baby. Jesus is one of us. Able to understand everything that we go through. Able to understand all of our longings and all of our struggles and all of our pains. And he is still hope, joy, peace, and love personified. Here to restore these characteristics in us as a byproduct of restored life in a relationship with our God. Jesus is life rediscovered. You know, if you're struggling this year, maybe you're asking, where is Jesus? Let me offer these words to you. Jesus is in our uncertainties, struggles, discouragements, and differences. He is in our celebrations and in our mournings. He is in our crying and in our rejoicing. He is in our fear and in our triumphs. He is in our losses and in our victories. He is in our brokenness and in our healing. He is in our sickness and in our health. And he is in our life and in our deaths. No matter where you are this morning, Jesus is there. And he is working, he is moving, he is offering life and, and forgiveness. He is calling us to trust and to, and to see beyond our circumstance. To see his deeper, bigger, broader, wider, higher picture and work. Jesus is in our world and in our lives. He is Emmanuel, God with us for eternity, and he will never leave nor forsake us. Jesus is the discovery of Christmas. Let us run like shepherds to encounter him this season. Let's worship and find renewal in his presence this year. Let us rediscover Christmas in the life that he brings with us and around us. Merry Christmas, Christ has come. Christ is here among us, and Christ will come again. Let me close this with these verses in Luke chapter 2. It says, But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, heaven and peace on earth,
his people he favors. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, Father, as we've heard your word, as we've looked at your, your birth of you willingly leave, wanting to leave heaven and come down to join us here on earth. Not just to be one of us, but to come to save us from our sins. And Father, may we all remember this season with joy and peace and love and hope. All the things that you personify to us. And Father, if there's one that is, that's here this morning that doesn't know the hope and the peace and the joy and love that you bring to our lives, may they come down this morning and accept you as their Lord and Savior. For it's in your holy and precious name that we ask these things. This morning, I do just want to remind you of a couple of announcements, um, is that there is no services Wednesday night. Uh, we hope that you will take this time to um, reflect on what the season stands for. Uh, if you're able to spend it with family and friends, I hope that you have a, a, a enjoyous time. Also, from our pastor and, the, and all of the staff, uh, we want to take and wish each and every one of you a safe and Merry Christmas. Uh, so we hope that, um, again, you just remember the reason for the season. Uh, hopefully you're not all caught up in the hustle and bustle and, and maybe all of the, the things that are taking place this year with, with everything that's going on. But we hope that you will definitely have an enjoyous and fun and a Merry Christmas this season. And I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Anthony Evans, if he would, to please close us in prayer.